All right, let's take our Bibles. If you have your Bible, I want you to turn in your Bible right now to the Gospel of Mark. And uh, as you turn there, I want you to find chapter 15. If you're a guest and you don't happen to have a Bible with you, we've got you covered. Just look inside the bulletin. You're going to find the passage there and the outline as well. And uh, I don't think I'll be that long. If you listen quick, I'll talk quick. But I've got something great to share with you, and I'm very excited about doing that. And so let's all stand together, shall we? And we'll stretch a little bit and stand in reverence to the Bible, God's Word. And let's turn to Mark 15. And we're going to read just one verse for the sake of time. And I am going to preach to you today about someone in the Bible that I have never preached about before. In 31 years of preaching here, about three times a week, uh, I've never preached about the centurion. And we're going to learn about someone that was at the cross when Jesus died for our sin. And I hope that you'll open your heart today and listen and let God speak to you about some of the decisions that this man made. So Mark chapter 15 and verse 39 is our scripture for this morning. <clears throat> and when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, truly this man was the son of God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you today for the wonderful privilege of honoring our first responders. I thank you for Tanya Owen and her family. I pray your blessings and grace upon them. I thank you, Father, uh, for the families of those who have given so much. I pray that you would encourage their hearts today. Now, Lord, speak to us through your word. Help me to say those things that you would have me to say this morning. And Lord, I pray that everyone here would consider who you are and whether or not they've ever truly believed on your name as their personal Savior. So speak to our hearts today, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, one of the great tragedies in the United States of America the last few years has been the mischaracterization on the part of some people in our society toward law enforcement. It's been disheartening at times to see the attitudes and the actions and the marches of people who are ungrateful for the sacrificial lives that are lived in our community every day. Now, I understand that nearly every occupation is misunderstood from time to time, and not everyone in every occupation is perfect. Sometimes there are uh, truly difficult things, sinful things, and oftentimes simply misunderstandings that come between us or a lack of communication. I heard about a New Yorker that was driving through Texas, and he was uh, going along, and as he was driving there, there was a collision that he had with a truck that was carrying a horse trailer behind it, and, and uh, there he was now in an insurance office trying to make a claim and having a little trouble in uh, getting the claim through, and the officer of the insurance agency said, now how can you claim to have all these injuries according to the police report? You said there was nothing wrong, you weren't hurt at all uh, at the site of the accident. Well, the New Yorker said, well, it's like this. He said, I was lying in the road in a lot of pain. I heard someone say that the horse had two broken legs and didn't look like it was going to make it. The next thing I know, the sheriff's deputy took out his gun and shot the horse. Then he looked at me and said, how are you feeling? He said, I was feeling great, I told him. Sometimes there's misunderstandings, and we certainly understand that. And this morning, we're going to look at a man in the Bible who at first glance may have seemed calloused, even heartless. But suddenly in his life, there was a complete change from his heart. His life was turned around when he saw and when he met the Lord Jesus Christ. And in fact, this man on this particular day, according to Matthew's Gospel, he feared greatly in his heart when he realized what had taken place. And he said, truly, this must be the Son of God. I want to speak to you today about a man in the Bible called the centurion. And if you're taking notes, I just want to quickly give you some background about the work of a centurion. Just to let you know who this man was. The centurion was a man that would have been feared by those underneath him. Feared by his men. He was a ruler of 100 men. He was the foundational leader of the Roman army. 
This was a tough man. In fact, the Bible tells us as one centurion came to Jesus in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 8, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, go, and he goeth, and I say to another, come, and he cometh, and I say to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. And so a centurion was a man of authority, and this particular centurion was given the authority on this day to watch over what was going to happen on a hill called Golgotha, the hill of the skull. He was to watch over the proceedings there of the crucifixion. And this was his responsibility. He was a man feared by his men. He was a man, secondly, faithful to Caesar. Faithful to Tiberius Caesar. And this particular Caesar served from 14 to 37 AD. And every Roman soldier viewed this Caesar somewhat like a god. They were polytheistic. They believed in many different gods. But Caesar was revered in that way. They received their pay from Caesar. They would receive their retirement after 20 years of faithful service to Caesar. They would be honorably discharged from the emperor. And many of them even earned Roman citizenship as they served in the Roman army. Uh, they did various types of service in their community. I found this interesting. They were civil servants of sorts. They, uh, when they were not at war, they were helping to construct roads and overseeing various improvements in their community. In fact, in Capernaum, when I uh, visited the synagogue there some years ago in Capernaum, I was able to hear the history of this uh, synagogue and be reminded from Scripture in Luke 7 and verse 4. The Bible says, And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he is worthy for whom he did this, uh, should do this, for he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. They said, Lord, help this centurion. Uh, he helped build us our synagogue. And so the centurions were actively involved in their community, making it a much better place to live. And of course, they were peacekeepers. This was one of their main jobs. Nowhere in the New Testament do you find anything negative written about the centurions. Everybody was glad when they came to make peace, to solve problems. They were revered and respected in the community. And by the way, peacekeeping is a big part of what our first responders do every day. Uh, and uh, there, was a, uh, there was a liberal preacher, so-called, and one of these guys that gets on the news, he's a preacher, talking against the police a few years ago. And I remember thinking to myself, man, when I call 911, I don't want that guy coming. How many of you are glad these first responders come? Amen. They come to bring peace many times to the neighborhood. I heard about a, a deputy that went to a home and there was a problem there, and he jumped back into the squad car. He got on the radio. He said, Sarge, I've got a real interesting case here. I've got a real problem here. He said, there's a woman that shot her husband for stepping on a wet floor. Sarge said, well, did you arrest her? He said, no, sir, the floor's still wet. <laughs> Just a lot of situations these guys get into, and the centurions were there to help keep the peace. And so this was the work of the centurion. And on this day... His job was to come to Golgotha and where he had seen many times before criminals executed to just oversee the process. And that brings us to our second thought this morning. That is the witness of the centurion. What did this man see today? Well, this man, first of all, was going to see a person. He's going to see the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And let's get a little background on that person. The Bible says in John 1.14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Now I want you to think about Jesus Christ, the Word. It is the word logos. It means the eternal Word. It is to say that Jesus Christ is eternal God. And the Word, the eternal God, became flesh. You know about that. You've heard of Mary and how the Holy Ghost came upon Mary and that which was born of her was the Holy Child, the Son of God. It was the eternal Word that became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld His glory. And so it was the centurion. He's coming to work just another day, just some more criminals uh, receiving capital punishment. And he comes this day to watch over the process not realizing that he was going to give witness to a person, an eternal person, a holy person. He was 100% God and 100% man. He was the God-man. Now the centurion didn't know that immediately. He would come to that conclusion. He just thought it was another day at work. 
but he sees this person. And he had watched him throughout the week. He saw him earlier in the week uh, as Jesus made his triumphal entry. And as the people said, Hosanna, Hosanna, King of the Jews. And they were so happy that he had come. But now he is being rejected. And John 19 says they cried out, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate said, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest said, we have no king but Caesar. And in Isaiah chapter 53, the Bible says of Jesus, he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And it, we, we hid, as it were, our faces from him. And he was despised and we esteemed him not. And so the centurion watches this incredible change of events. It's amazing how the momentum had changed and how the heart for Jesus had changed. He saw how he was rejected. And yet even as Jesus was rejected, and even as the Roman soldiers had placed the nails through his hands and through his feet, and even as the crown of thorns was placed upon his head, the centurion watches Jesus at this very day, not filled with anger, not filled with hatred, but he watches him as he is filled with love for everyone there. The crowd all around him was jeering and mocking. And yet the centurion watched Jesus as he said in Luke 23, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The centurion had never seen that before. No one ever cried out to God in heaven to forgive those that were crucifying him. This man, this Jesus, was different. Even the thief on the cross next to him, the thief said to the Lord Jesus, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. I mean, here's a man on the left side of Jesus who's a common criminal who deserved his punishment. And, and, and he says to Jesus, he says, Jesus, remember me. Remember me, Lord, I want to go to heaven. And Jesus said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And perhaps the centurion thought, well, who is this man to say that this other man can go to heaven? Only God can say who goes to heaven. And the centurion would have been right. No church can get you to heaven. No pastor can get you to heaven. No priest, no pope, no religion can get anyone to heaven. Only God can get us into heaven. And God made a way. And he sent his son. And his son died upon the cross. And even in the process of his death, the love was coming forth. The love for the crowd that jeered him. The, the love for a criminal that didn't deserve his love. And even at that moment, Jesus looked down and he saw his own mother. And he said, woman, behold thy son. And he said to John, the beloved disciple, behold thy mother. From the cross, he saw this person, this Jesus. And and then from the cross, as the centurion stood there, he saw the pain that Jesus was experiencing. First, they took him to what was called the praetorium. It was the household of the Roman guards. And it was there that Pilate could not find him guilty. But to appease the crowd, Jesus was beaten with a cat of nine tails. This uh, leather object with glass and metal at the end would come across someone's back until the skin would rip away, until the bones were showing, until the blood would begin to flow down. He was scourged there, Mark tells us. He was beaten with a cat of nine tails. And no doubt the centurion saw this beating and knew of the pain of the beating, perhaps swung a few of the licks himself. The pain of the scourging was only to be followed by the pain of the cross. Jesus walked the way of the cross, the Via Della Rosa, as some have called it. The crown of thorns was placed upon his head, sometimes six inches long, shoved into his brow. The blood now begins to flow, and, and now the pain is being excruciating upon the Lord Jesus Christ. John 19 says, They delivered him, therefore, where he would be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing the cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is the Hebrew word Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side. The historian Josephus refers to the crucifixion as the most wretched of all Roman deaths. It was the worst way to die. In fact, the word excruciating means from the cross. It was from this way of dying that the word excruciating came into our vocabulary. And there the centurion saw him, a person. God, yes, but God came down in flesh. And there the centurion watched this God-man. 
And there he saw him in excruciating pain. And all the while loving. And all the while forgiving. But the centurion not only saw the person, he not only sensed the pain, but he saw the price that was paid for sin. He saw the price that was paid for sin. John 19, 34, But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith there came blood with water. The water from the sack around the heart, I believe showing that Jesus died of a broken heart. The blood that came forth is the price that was paid for sin. Now remember this, Hebrews 9.22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. When John the Baptist saw Jesus as he began his earthly ministry, as he came into the Jordan River area, he looked up and he saw Jesus and he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. You see, in the Old Testament, the Jews would sprinkle the blood of the Lamb on the Ark of the Covenant, on the mercy seat, and it was called the Day of Atonement. But Jesus came to be the final sacrifice. Jesus came to shed His blood. And without the shedding of the blood, there is no remission of sin. Let me just put it bluntly. If Jesus had not died and shed His blood, none of us would have hope of going to heaven. I don't care how many churches we start, attend, or rituals we accomplish. If Jesus Christ had not paid the price, there is no way that we would have hope today. 1 Peter 1.18, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things such as gold and silver from your vain conversation or your past life, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. And so the centurion came, he thought, to just another day of work. But here was a person like no person he'd ever seen. And here was a pain like no man could ever endure. And here was a price that was being paid, the blood that was being shed, not from Adam's bloodline, for he was not just another man. He was conceived of the Holy Ghost. This blood that was being shed was heaven's blood being shed for the sins of the world, for people who needed redemption, a way back to God. And that way is Jesus Christ, you see. Jesus said, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And so we see the work of the centurion and the witness of the centurion. But I want you to see finally this morning, and, and perhaps most importantly now, the will of the centurion. God has created you and me with the ability to make decisions, to turn toward Him. God has given that ability to mankind since the very first of his creation, Adam and Eve, who chose their own way. And the Bible says, wherefore by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sin. Adam and Eve prove that man can make right or wrong choices. Now tradition tells us that the centurion, his name was Longinus, and ultimately he became a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's a wonderful story. But I'm the type of person that likes to think, now where did this happen? You know, where was the change? What was the thing that really made the difference in his life? Uh, how did that church start? How did that couple meet? How did that business get going? Was it in a garage somewhere? What's the beginning of it? What was the genesis of that? And I ask this question today. How was this centurion's life changed? What was it that really caused him to turn around? And I believe you can sum that up in one word, and that was the word believe. He believed that Jesus Christ was who he said he was. And the Bible declares that in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever, say it with me, believeth in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. And this man believed. Revelation twenty two seventeen and the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Did you catch that phrase? Whosoever will, let him come. This is the message of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done. You can come to Jesus Christ. I remember counseling a young lady years ago, and she'd had an abortion, and she was so guilt-ridden and and wished it had never happened. And she said, I don't think God would ever want me in heaven. And I'm here to tell you, it doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. Whosoever means whosoever. Whosoever will may come. It may be a centurion 
who was seen as rough and cruel, but the message was whosoever will may come. And so I want you to see, first of all, his declaration. The Bible tells us in this passage that he declared in verse number 39, truly this man was the Son of God. You see, you've got to determine today, is Jesus just another one of the paths? Is he just another good guy? Are all religions about the same as they tell us? Is Jesus just one of the good teachers or the good prophets? Is he, as they teach in various different cults, a good teacher but not the Son of God? This is what so many say. You see, people do have a lot of different views on Jesus these days. And we hear about, we hear about the Republican Jesus, the Democrat Jesus, the therapist Jesus who helps us cope with life's problems, the open-minded Jesus. Uh, we hear about the touchdown Jesus who helps us make touchdowns and helps boxers get the knockout. We hear about the therapist Jesus, the hippie Jesus who teaches everyone to give a piece a chance and, and uh, imagine the world without religion and remember that love is all you need. You've heard of that one. You've heard of the guru Jesus uh, who's wise and an inspirational teacher and helps you find your center. I mean, every false religion says they believe in Jesus. Every guru says they believe in Jesus. Every imam says they believe in Jesus. Everyone says they believe in some concept of Jesus. But ladies and gentlemen, we better get the right concept of Jesus today. He is the perfectly sinless Son of God who was tempted in all points like as we are, yet He never sinned. And when He went to the cross, He went there as your representative and mine. It should have been me on that cross. I'm the sinner. It should have been us on that cross. We fall short of the glory of God. But Jesus, the Son of God, went there and shed his blood in our stead. We better get the right comprehension of who he was. He is the son of the living God today. He is the Father, the Son, the three in one. Uh, he is equal with God the Father. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And my friend, if he's just another guy uh, like the guru or just another guy like the imam says or just another kind of a religious person, I'm going to tell you something. He couldn't have paid for our sin. But if he was the Son of God, then that blood that was shed is the payment for the sin of all who believe. Now this centurion, he came just for another day's work. But this was a different day. This was the day when he said, truly, this is the Son of God. Why would he say that? I believe for many reasons, but one of them was, it dawned on him, he finally understood, this was the sinless Son of God. This man, this God-man, was without sin. Pilate said it, Luke 23, he said, I have examined him before you, and I have found no fault in him. Even the thief on the cross in Luke 23 said, uh, we receive a due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing amiss. And I believe the centurion, who no doubt had heard of Jesus throughout Jerusalem, who had followed him to the praetorium, who had seen the beatings that he took, who saw no angst, no wickedness, no hatred, only love, who saw from the cross forgiveness, who heard him say, you're going to go to heaven with me today, who heard him speak to the Father as if they were one. Suddenly it dawned on this man, this man's man, Truly, this is the Son of God. And he realized that Jesus was without sin. And no doubt, in the presence of Jesus, he also realized that he was a sinner. Like Isaiah of old who said, I am a man that is undone. I am a man of unclean lips. I mean, when he got close to God, he said, I am unworthy. Woe is me. I am unworthy. And, and, and the Bible says in Romans chapter 3 and verse number 10, for uh, Romans 3, 10, that there is none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, let me, let's just get this down on the bottom shelf, too. We say, that's right, there's a lot of sinners in this world, and I'm glad these guys are locking them up. By the way, how many of you are glad for that? Hallelujah. Lock them up. That's fine. They deserve it. But let's be honest beyond that. How many of you are willing to say, I'm a sinner too? <laughs> come on, some of you, come on, help me out here. This, this can take as long as you want to take. <laughs> hey, how about, let me just put it down this way. I'm a pastor. I've been a pastor for 31 years in this city. I have four wonderful children, nine wonderful, perfect grandchildren. I've been really blessed. Let me tell you something about me. I'm a sinner. Let me tell you about my children. They're sinners. Let me tell you about my nine grandchildren. They're sinners too. <laughs> all means all. 
And I think the centurion, though he had a great reputation, though he had an honorable career, though he thought, you know, he had arrived somewhat, when you're standing next to Jesus, you realize, hey, I'm a sinner. I'm not going to make it to heaven on my own. I can't forgive my own sin. All of us are sinners. It's like the mother that heard some screaming in the room down the hall, and she went down there, and the little three-year-old girl had her finger into the little seven-year-old boy's hair, and she was pulling. She had some of the hair right in her hand, and she was pulling away, and, and, and the mom said to the seven-year-old boy, oh, she didn't mean it. It's, it'll be okay. She, she doesn't understand what it feels like when someone pulls hair. It's going to be okay, and she kind of settled the situation. She started back toward the kitchen, and then she heard a blood-curdling scream again. And she rushed back to the room, and this time she saw the little seven-year-old boy, and she said, what in the world happened? He said, well, she knows what it feels like now. <laughs> you know, you don't have to teach kids that kind of stuff. They just learn it on their own. We are born as sinners. The Bible says we're all sinners. And I believe the centurion declared, this is the Son of God, because he saw for the first time in his life perfect, a perfect man, a man who was one with the Father, a man who could forgive sin. And he saw himself in the light of that cross. Hey, comparing ourselves with ourselves, we're not wise. Well, I'm better than the crooks. I'm better than that one. I'm better than this one. That's all good. But let's see ourselves the way it really is. All of us fall short of the glory of God. He's the only perfect one. And so we hear his declaration, but I want you to see his decision. In that moment, when Jesus gave up the ghost, the centurion said, surely this was the Son of God. He made a statement. He made a decision. And Matthew 27 says that when this was happening, he feared greatly. Something came into his heart and said, listen, I, I've been on the wrong side of this equation. There's a wonderful song we all sing. It's called Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. You know that song? Sing it with me. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. Wonderful song. But many times we don't sing that third verse. And I want you to see it with me. The third verse says, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear." and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. This song was written by a man named John Newton who lived in Olney, England. I've been to the church where he pastored, but before he became a pastor, he was in the business of slave trading. He was one of the most despicable human beings that ever lived. He was a man that was completely unworthy. That's why he got so excited about grace. Because when he repented of his sin, and he said, Lord, I've been so wrong, and Lord, I believe on you, and I believe that you're the Son of God, God forgave him and gave him a brand new life. And he recalls that by saying, it was grace that taught my heart to fear. And I believe that as Jesus was there on the cross, this centurion, according to the Bible, had fear come into him. It was a realization of how awesome God was and how needy he was. Have you ever gotten to that place? Or may I ask you, what is it going to take to get you to that place? To that place where you realize, I need the Lord. I need His sacrifice. And this man believed that day on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says in 1 John 5, 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. You see, the Bible teaches that you can know you're on your way to heaven. The Bible teaches you can know that your sins are forgiven. Sometimes people say, well, I hope I go to heaven. I think I might go to heaven. Hey, listen, the Bible says you can know you're going to heaven by believing on the name of the Son of God. Now think of this verse, and we're done. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he, speaking of the Father, he hath made him, speaking of the Son, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God through him. God the Father gave his Son, who knew no sin, 
Jesus Christ took my sin upon himself. He shed his blood for my sin so that when I am in Christ, when I believe on Christ, I can be declared righteous, not because I deserve that, but because Jesus paid the price. You see, I owed a debt I could not pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. And that's why I have a home in heaven today. It's called grace. And that's what Jesus did for you. And that's what Jesus did for me. And so the centurion, he made a decision. He made a declaration. He stood there humbled in the presence of Christ, considering what Jesus had said, and he declared his faith in Jesus Christ. Now, can I just tell you this? Every one of us make decisions of faith every day. You get in a car, you drive to L.A., you enter into contractual agreements. Terry and I were speaking this week in Colorado at a couple's retreat. And uh, we got done speaking uh, Friday afternoon, and we were getting ready to come back home, and we flew into Denver, and they had 14 inches of snow in Denver on Friday, spring snowstorm. So here we are. We'd already missed a couple flights. They're de-icing. They're trying to get a few out here and there. And we had a decision to make. I mean, we had to decide, will the de-ice machine get enough antifreeze on that plane to last until we get up high enough? I'd never met the pilot. Does this guy know how to fly in snow? I didn't have a chance to check his training record. All these thoughts are going through my mind. Heavy snows coming down, sticking to the wing. On top of that, we were flying United. <laughs> and I thought, will I even get to go in the sky or will they have oversold and they'll drag me out like the guy on TV? <laughs> Big decisions. We decided we'd risk it. And by faith, we got on that plane. And by faith, we got to Burbank, and our suitcases got home the next day. But that's another story. <laughs> we make decisions all the time by faith. Have you ever come to that place in your life where you saw yourself falling short of God? You, you admit it. I'm a sinner. I know it. And by faith, you received Jesus Christ as your Savior. You see, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. There is none other name given under men whereby we must be saved. It's His name that really matters. I made that decision on April the 5th, 1972. I realized that going to church wasn't going to get me to heaven. Having a dad who was a preacher, I couldn't hold on to his coat and jump up to heaven. I had to make my own decision. I'm not talking about, you know, saying some words at catechism here. I'm not talking about getting baptized. I'm talking about... A volitional, willful decision to believe and trust Jesus Christ alone as my Savior. And I prayed that prayer, and I asked Jesus Christ to forgive my sin and to come into my life and that his blood would cover my sin and to give me a home in heaven. And the Bible says in 1 John 5, 12, He that has the Son has life, and he that has not the Son of God has not life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Maybe you're like the centurion this morning. You got a lot going on. Your, your, your life is coming along in order. But when you stand next to Jesus and you consider who he is, have you done the important thing? Have you humbled yourself to say, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me, to come into my life and be my savior. That's life's most important decision. The centurion made it. He's glad he did. I invite you, my friend, to trust Christ in that same way today.